You can't beat this 99 Mercury Grand Marquis. Now, a customer of mine just bought this thing from the original little old lady owner, and it's only got 55,000 miles on it. Look, it still looks as sharp as it did the day it was made. And we check on the hood. It's got the big, old, dependable V8 engine. This particular one's a 4.6, extremely strong engine big engine you'd think it'd be a big gas hog but these things really work this thing gets about 17 in town and it gets a whopping 28 on the highway because the way they're set up the rpms are pretty low when you're going 60 miles an hour it's set up for cruising you could drive these things all day long and check the inside still in immaculate shape and it's got semi-bucket seats. It's not the old bench seats like they had when I was a kid. No, the back's a little more couchy, but you can see. Man, there's some serious leg room in this thing. And this one's unique because it's got the digital dash. It's still working perfectly fine, too. Of course, it has power everything. Radio's got a lot of set buttons on it for something this old, 1999. It's pretty well set up, and look, the wood dash is still in good shape. Tons of headroom for you big people. Look, I still got a whole bunch of room before my head hits it. Check out the back seat. A lot of leg room in these things. Close the door. Nice solid door too. Hey, there's a lot of room inside this thing. It is not small. And of course the trunk, it is gigantic. It just goes and goes and goes. And check out the original wheels. 21 years old. Man, they're still shining. Look at that. It's amazing. Let's just say they don't make them like they used to. I see modern cars, they're three years old, and the LA wheels are already pitting. They made things well back in the day. And if you do need to fix things, look at the working room. You never see that anymore. The AC is still blowing ice cold. The power steering's still working. The ABS is still working. They did start to put beauty covers on these things. I don't know why they bothered, but... You know, even back in 99. Now with this overbuilt engine and a solid transmission, these things can basically run forever if you take care of them. But this one will start her up, starts right up. It's only got 55,000 miles on it. Check it out. This baby isn't even broken in yet. See these things with 300,000 miles on it. But it's a 21 year old car that's only got 55,000 miles on it. Even the rear defroster still works. And check out the digital readout. Not something you need a science degree to operate. Look, you wanna check the things? You just push a button and it goes to the different ones. You don't have to think, oh, which button do I push? Now what do I do? Simple to use. As you can see here, I just turned the overdrive off. With the overdrive turned on, he's getting in the high 20s on the highway on this thing. And realize, it's a classic rear wheel drive car. They handle the best. People that are real serious about driving, they almost always want rear wheel drive car. There's a reason race cars are rear wheel drive. They just handle better. This thing is a classic rear wheel drive. I've seen the differential still working fine, even with 300,000 miles on them. Pretty much, you take care of it with normal oil changes and regular maintenance, they can last forever. So let's start it up. Start it right up. Take it for a little spin. Now realize, they are kind of like land yachts. When you drive them, you more or less point and sail. <laughs> they are a cushy ride, but you know, they're not tight handling. It's an old design. And with that big old V8 engine, I'll wait till these people are out of the way so I don't scare them. You punch it, it gets up and goes. And the ride, hey, it's smooth. Even though it's 21 years old. You hit bumps, all this weight absorbs most of the bumps. And it's not that sloppy when you're cornering. And strangely enough, my customer is a teenager. This is his first car. So, you know, it goes from the old generation to the young generation. And there's a lot of people buying these things now. A lot of younger guys are souping them up. Some of them turn them into low riders. It's a giant platform. You can do whatever you want with it. Now, odds are you're not going to find too many 21-year-old ones. They're only 55,000 miles on it from the original owner. But there are a lot of elderly people that buy these, the Crown Vicks. A lot of them don't drive that much much anymore. Luckily, had good control. The car's not full of dings. I get quite a few of them come over here that they're still running good, but man, they got a lot of bashes in them from running into stuff in parking lots. But this one's whistle clean. Hard finding one with that kind of low mileage. But even if they had 100,000 miles on it, I've seen these things go over 300,000 miles. You just pay less money, that's all. 
But if you find a cherry one like this, somebody's asking five grand, odds are it's going to sell for five grand. Don't try to argue them down real far and then the next guy comes in with five grand and buys it from under you. So really, if you're looking for a family cruiser or you're like my customer, a teenager just likes old big American cars, you really can't go wrong with one of these, especially with low mileage like this. What are you going to get for $5,000 these days, you know? One fifth of a car, maybe a new one? You got a big old solid built one. Like I said, look at those wheels. The wheels still are in excellent shape. They used to make them a lot better than they do today, I'll tell you. And classier too, look. Chrome, chrome, chrome. Not just mono painted cars that look like blobs that came out of an injection mold. And yeah, maybe chrome doesn't get you home, but hey, it sure gives off a good look even on a 21 year old one. Here's a 97 Toyota Camry that the customer bought over a year ago for $1,200. And he wants me to make sure it's going to pass the inspection so we can put Texas tags on it. $1,200 for a Toyota that still runs. Now first we'll start with the matter at hand that he originally brought it over here for. Will it pass the state emissions test so that he can get a sticker and put Texas plates? We'll just plug the scan tool in. Plugs in right there. It starts doing its thing. Well, it's communicating. I have to put it in manually. 97 car, a Toyota, Camry, four cylinder, 2.2 liter, automatic transmission. And here we go. And while we're waiting, I'll turn on the AC because man, it's hot. And it may be an old Toyota, but ooh, it's blowing nice cold air still. Now we want to see if it's going to pass the state inspection. So it's reading the data. No code, so it'll probably pass. But we're going to go back. We're going to go to special functions here, OBD2 functions. And we go to state OBD check. That's what we want. So we push the button, and what does it say? Mill status is off, no codes, eight monitors okay, none incomplete. Aha, this thing's gonna pass the test now and all everything, we're working perfectly fine, no codes. But I'm gonna go a little bit further with my fancy scan tool just to see what kind of shape this old baby's in. So we've hooked up the fancier scan tool for that. We picked out Toyota. We can't do automatic selection, it's too old. So we'll go to the manual selection. Diagnosis, auto scan. Scroll through the live data. Short term fuel, long term fuel. It adds quite a bit. It's old. So I'm assuming the fuel injectors are somewhat dirty, so it has to add some extra fuel to make it run right. That's typical in a car that's got almost 200,000 miles on it. The fuel trim though isn't bad. It's 99.15, 100.00 is perfect. Pretty good for a car with 200,000. There's no misfires. As you can see, there's no misfires in any of the cylinders, one, two, three, or four. And even the transmission has no problems. Sure, it's an old four-speed automatic, but it still runs fine. You can still turn the overdrive on and off if you want. I just leave it on so it gets better gas mileage. Pretty amazing shape when you consider this thing's 23 years old, has almost 200,000 miles on it, and the guy only paid 1,200 bucks for it a year ago in Michigan. He's gonna have no problems getting it registered in Texas, so let's just check under the hood. Now under the hood is a four cylinder engine, but not just any four cylinder engine. It's the Toyota renowned two 0.2 liter four cylinder engine. When they replaced this engine, they did have some production problems. They burned oil. Toyota replaced a lot of piston rings and pistons, rebuilding the engines free because they were burning excessive amounts of oil. This 2.2 cylinder engine never had that problem. This thing's got almost 200,000 miles, burns less than half a quart of oil between oil changes. You can't complain about that. Now this engine only has 133 horsepower. The one in 2007 had 158. Not all that much difference. This thing's got plenty enough get up and go. Being extremely mass produced, parts of these things are cheap and easy to get. He did have to replace the radiator himself. He bought it for 69 bucks. Did his own replacement. Not bad. Sure it's an old car. The hubcaps are gone. <laughs> The paint's coming off the bumper, but that's not the car's fault. Somebody hit it. And the other side doesn't have hubcaps either, but it's still a solid car. We check out the trunk and look, it's the LE, so it's got the gold to it. And the key doesn't work anymore. Well, <laughs> you gotta expect these things. The key's probably so worn out, it starts the car. So we'll just pop the trunk this way. As long as it starts the car, who cares? Open it up. He's got his jack. Got the nice big Camry trunk. You can fit a lot of stuff in here. 
You can even hear it solid when it slams. Now as old as it is, the original front struts are still in decent shape. We'll hop it in, check the interior. They really wear well. It's got stains on it. There's lots of room in the back. But hey, they're not even ripped apart yet. Start it up. Typical Toyota start right up. Turn on the AC because I'm hot. And we'll take it for a spin. Back we go. Well, normal driving. Still handles decent other than the back bouncing. Your clunks here and there. The transmission is still shifting like a dream. Let's see if it's got any takeoff left to it. Here we go. Hey, it was even burning rubber. <laughs> These things are almost indestructible. They really are amazing cars. And yeah, you can hear the noises. Oh, the suspension systems get loud on these things, make all kinds of noise as they're worn. But as you drive them down the road, they're still pretty comfortable vehicles. 23 years and 200,000 miles later. Hey, what a steal for 1200 bucks. It even still tracks pretty good, doesn't pull one way or the other. Brakes work perfectly fine, quiet. These were well thought out and built vehicles. Heck, this 97 might be the perfect beater car of all time. I wouldn't be surprised if 10 years from now, this thing is still going down the road. And if you wouldn't mind having the back bumper painted and all the paint polished, the white paint's still there, it just needs to be buffed out, it'd still be a sharp looking car. The only real downside of this car is it came from Michigan. It's a Michigan car. So a lot of the parts have superficial rust and some have a little bit more than superficial rust on them. As you can see here inside the brake calipers, they're getting pretty rusty. Just check them out. You can see they're all rust. Now that's superficial rust, but he did have to replace the other side. Which he bought at AutoZone for less than 50 bucks. So <laughs> like I say, you can get parts for these things easy. They don't cost that much and they continue to roll down the road. So now you know the truth about this old 97 Camry. Why it might be the perfect beater car for anyone who wants a car that still has cold AC and still rides pretty decent down the road. It's decent gas mileage with 200,000 miles. Probably isn't going to break down all that much in the future. A Civic Type are. Honda's gone a long way from the original Civic that had a little bitty two-cylinder air-cooled motorcycle engine to this 306 horsepower monster. This is one special Honda Civic. Now certainly not a cheap Econobox car. A customer recently bought this one brand new. It's a 2019 for about $38,000. They're not giving them away. Now unlike other Civics, this thing gets 22 in the city and 28 on the highway which is horrible gas mods for a car this small. But on the other hand, when you check under the hood, that's really not bad gas mileage for an engine that puts out 306 horsepower. I mean, just a while back, people thought it was really something that they could get 100 horsepower out of every liter engine size. This thing is two liters. It's got 306, so it's got more than 150 horsepower per liter. It's a lot of power for a small car. After all, Honda's really known as an engine company. They make more four-stroke internal combustion engines every year than any other company in the world. And in this case, the R isn't just some fake name stuck up. This thing is really made for racing. You might think, oh, all this stuff, it looks like a toy. It's not a toy. Everything serves a purpose. From the air dam on the back, when you're going really fast, helps downforce. And even when you go up here, you'll notice these. Well, those are to create vortexes so that it works even better. This was designed by engineers. This wasn't some kid making a cool looking toy. There's reason behind all of this. And as we go down the side, this isn't style. These flares are to help cool the engine and the brakes. This thing was designed with racing in mind. Check out these giant calipers. They're Brembo, top of the line racing brakes. Drilled rotors so you don't get fade when you're racing. Slamming on the brakes, stopping on the gas. This is a serious driver's car. As we go to the back of the car, this isn't just for show. This is an engineered tuned exhaust system. Makes a nice sound too. And a rather unique expression having a triple. Not a double, but a triple. Now as we go inside, you can see it's set up for racing. Not fancy leather stuff, but serious racing seats when you're cornering. And this thing, man, does it corner. Start it up. Of course, being a Honda, it starts right up first thing. Got all kinds of fancy stuff in the dash. And 
if you mess around with the computer setup it can even be run for track racing keep laps in it this is a serious car honda links app links settings navigation this is a seriously designed car for a driver and as with any serious driver's car what's smack in the middle not a speedometer the tachometer so you can match revs while you're driving and you want to race around you can put it on race suspension or you can put it on normal or you can put it on comfort. You're not racing around, you want a little more comfortable? You can make the suspension system softer so it rides better. Six speed standard transmission. Honda makes great standard transmissions. They're killer for shifting. As we get out, look at this. It's a four door. Hey, now he's got it down for his dogs and stuff. Shows the seats go down. You got quite a bit of room. When you put the seats up, there's still a reasonable amount of space for sitting. It's not that tiny. And yes, it does have a trunk. Regular size trunk. You can put stuff. Like I say, if you flop the seats back, you got a lot of space to carry stuff. It's a handy utilitarian car too. But of course, that's not why you buy a Civic Type R. You buy a Civic Type R to drive fast. Why would you pay $38,000 up if you just want a little utilitarian car? Go get a plain Civic then. Don't spend all this money. Now this thing, just doesn't look fast and have a big engine. It's got a special front suspension for racing. This thing is made for cornering. I've driven actual race cars. This thing is pretty close. You get real tight steering this thing. Cornering like mad. You can see it's low to the ground. This thing was designed for going fast, both in a straight line, more importantly, on curves. Not really surprising though, but Honda started as a motorcycle company. This is kind of like a four wheel motorcycle. For people who are getting old like me, that the two wheel ones are getting a little bit too dangerous. This thing, this low to the ground, it's made to corner. The lower you go, the better they corner. It is a little bit rough riding on bumpy roads. This thing wasn't made for that. It's made for going fast. It'll go down the road. Even a normal Civic isn't the greatest ride in the world. But they've made it as good as they can with their active suspension system. You can put it on the comfort setting so it's going to ride as good as it can in town. But then as soon as you either get on a track or you're out on the highway, put it in a racing mode, it's going to be a lot stiffer and it's really going to handle well. Now if we had x-ray vision, we could see this has a very lightweight chassis. The hood's all aluminum. It's a very strong yet light car. It's made for going fast. That is its main purpose in life. Now just to compare, my Celica there has 110 horsepower in a 2600 pound vehicle. This has 306 horsepower in a vehicle that only weighs 400 pounds more than that. So <laughs> you got an extra almost 200 horsepower for 400 pounds extra weight. <laughs> it's a lot of power. Now purists might say, hey the Celica weighs less than this. Well, the reason this weighs more, it's got solid, heavy-duty racing components. You can't make things light and cheap if you're going to drive it as hard as this thing. This thing is made for speed, and you got to have some kind of weight with speed, strong parts. You're not going to be using lightweight, cheap plastic suspension parts on a car without much power. They'd snap. This thing is solidly built. So in this case, some weight is actually a good thing. You don't want a super light, fast car. Be too light, take off. So this is a happy medium between a lot of speed, strength, so it'll last both in terms of how long it'll last in mileage and how much it can take on the road when you're really racing around you don't want some cheap part breaking off when you're doing a hundred something miles an hour now i know some people are going to see this earth dreams technology and they're going to say oh i don't want to buy this it has oil dilution problems but eh, that's not correct it's the 1.5 liter honda engines they have the oil dilution problems, not the two liter ones that they put in this screaming monster. They're arguing back and forth about the oil dilution problems anyway. And what it comes down to basically, they seem to be diluting before the engine's warmed up. This little thing, man, it warms up fast. It's set for speed, doesn't take long to warm these up. So even if you're only driving a few miles, this thing's warmed up fast. It's not like the little 1.5 liter. But enough talk, let's take this thing for a spin. Start her up. Yeah, we'll roll up the windows. It may be a little race car, but it still has all the conveniences, the air conditioning, a nice backup camera. So let's see how it accelerates. Takes off fast, especially at high RPMs. That's what this engine was made for. Now, it's not a particularly quiet car inside. It's made for zipping around, but man, the suspension, this thing is so tight. You turn that wheel, and the brakes, man, they're killer with those big Brembos. Like I said, you're gonna feel bumps in this car. 
It's more of a race car, not something that you tootle around and rides like a Lexus. It handles and rides like a race car. If you're buying one of these, that's what you're looking for. But even though it is fast, look at it. Smooth as can be sitting there idling. You can't feel this four cylinder engine. No vibration. The stick shift isn't shaking at all. These are perfectly designed engines. And you tag it out on a highway. Hey, that's where this thing shines. Crisp steering. You don't get any understeering or oversteering. This thing tracks great. You want to blow the doors off one of these Mercedes? Hey, no problem at all. If it hadn't been made on the outside with all this racing stuff, it'd be a great sleeper car. <laughs> now I do have to say one thing that surprises me in this car is it is just a front wheel drive car, but it doesn't have any of that classic oversteer. It handles great. Honda has figured out how to make a little race car that's front wheel drive. Now they're talking they might make an all wheel drive one or ever, but as it stands, this is front wheel drive and you would never know it by driving it around. It handles great. I realize that if you're gonna drive one of these things seriously the way it was designed, you're playing in the upper RPMs. It doesn't really have a bunch of kick until it gets over 5,000 RPMs. When the turbo and the variable valve timing kicks in, then it just screams. So this has to be driven like a race car if you're driving it seriously. You shift it at slow speeds, it'll run fine like any Honda Civic. You gotta get the revs up there if you really wanna take full advantage of what this thing was designed for. Why? you should buy a Lexus. But strangely enough, I'm gonna start with why you shouldn't buy a Lexus. And that's because they cost too much money. <laughs> I'm cheap. I would have never bought one in the past, but I got this one for my wife years ago. One of my customers got it from his father. They were tired of it. And I gave him $3,000 for the car, even though it only had 60,000 miles on it. Yeah, it was like 12 years old, but I don't care. I know these things can last. So when it was new in 2002, it was a $34,000 car. So basically I paid less than one tenth of the original price for a vehicle that I've had customers, yes, 300s, that had 400,000 miles on it. With 60,000 miles, 80% of its lifespan left. I would never buy a new one regardless of the cost because I think they're ugly. I like the old style front. Those new one with those giant scowling mouth plastic front ends. I think that's one of the ugliest designs ever. And sure, a lot of cars are all copying now that big scowling front grill. People think, oh, that's popular, that's cool. And they go out and they buy something they want it to look like that. Me, I think it's ugly. I like the old ones, they're better looking. Face it, you want a big nah in the front of your car, it just looks stupid. Now the reason I love this Lexus is because, hey, I'm getting older. These things are really comfortable and luxurious. Now, this car is 18 years old, but the seats, the leather's still in really good shape. It's amazing. And being a Lexus, things hardly ever break. Now, in the interest of honesty, yes, I put lots of parts on this car, but for a rather odd reason. I use it as a test car to test out brakes, rotors, all kinds of car parts. I tell them, send me stuff for a 2002 ES 300. I'll see if your products are any good. And Here's something that I found out that kind of surprised even me. A couple years ago, a company sent me brand new front struts for the suspension. So I put them on this car, and at the time the car was 16 years old with the original struts. And lo and behold, it rode much worse with the brand new struts. Now they weren't original equipment struts, they were aftermarket ones. But it rode so much worse with the new ones, I put the old ones back on. So here we're talking about a car with 16 year old struts that still rode fine. The new aftermarket ones rode worse than these old ones. They can last that long? That tells me they're building these things right. Check inside the door. Made in Japan. There's just something about serious Japanese car manufacturers and motorcycle manufacturers for that matter. They take it seriously they keep building the car quality. You don't see that with cars that are built in lots of other countries. No, it's not a race car. It's got plenty enough horsepower with a V6. You could cruise all day long when we drove to Big Ben. The speed limit was like 85 miles an hour. We did 90 the whole way on cruise control. Didn't skip a beat. It's got the proven ASIN transmission. I changed the fluid a couple of times. 
that's it. Still shifts like a dream. And sure, I upgraded the headlights so they look cooler, but that's the advantage of a platform like this. A lot of the parts that are newer style will fit on the older ones, especially aftermarket ones. So you can upgrade it if you want. Hey, I'd rather buy $250 worth of headlights than buy a brand new Lexus for what, $45,000, $50,000 these days, and up. But even though it still kind of looks and runs like a new car, the insurance on it is dirt cheap. This is an 18 year old car. I think I gotta pay like 500 bucks a year insurance on this thing. Check out the insurance on a new car. If it gets wrecked or stolen and it's a $60,000 car, they gotta put the $60,000 payout. Don't think your insurance is gonna be cheap on that. They got big giant trunks with lots of space. But really the main selling point is luxury and they can last so long. Many luxury cars, hey, they fall apart. They want you to buy a new one every four or five years. These things weren't made that way. Take the engine, it's naturally aspirated, doesn't have a supercharger, doesn't have a turbocharger, isn't GDI high pressure injector. It's the plain old V6 fuel injected engine like in a Corolla or in a Toyota pickups. They're known for reliability. They can last a long time, you don't have to do anything to them but change the oil. I'm a fan of the V6 ones. I'm not really a fan of the big V8 ones. Yeah, they're a bit more luxurious, but as they age, those engines are more expensive to work on. They're much harder to work on. Give you an idea, you got a V8 engine. In order to change the starter on the later model ones, you gotta pull the intake manifold off. You're gonna spend over a thousand bucks changing the starter. I changed the starter out in this thing, I think it took me 15 minutes. Yeah, starters are gonna wear out in any car, but guess what? I went to AutoZone and bought the starter. It's been in there for six years, works perfectly fine. The advantage of this is, a lot of it is just Toyota Camry parts. A lot of them are totally interchangeable and there's a big aftermarket for them. So you can do what you want without having to spend a fortune at the Lexus dealer on their outrageously overpriced parts. And look, even when they're dirty, I haven't washed this thing in two weeks. They still look good. Of course, a lot of that depends on the color that you get in a car. If you're gonna get a black car, it's gonna look dirty in two hours anyways. But if you get a color like this, it doesn't show dirt all that bad, so you don't have to wash it as much. And like I said, the quality's just there. Take these leather seats. The previous luxury car that my wife had was an old Toyota Cressida. And those seats got so cracked, it looked like the Grand Canyon inside. So I covered them with these great New Zealand pure wool seat covers that were like 250 bucks a piece. But one day my wife said, I don't know, something's weird in my car. So I took those New Zealand sheepskin covers off and inside those crested or cracked leather seats. Believe it or not, there was a colony of ants with eggs and everything. When I pulled it off, they scrambled and ran all over the place. I don't know what the heck they're doing on a mobile car that's driving around, but an entire colony of ants made inside. The leather seats were just not made that well then. But hey, these are 18 years old and they still look great. That's just what I call quality. Now I know some people are saying, oh Scotty, how much did Lexus pay you to see how great their cars are? Well, I don't think they paid me anything considering that I said I would never buy a brand new one because I think those grills are as ugly as can be. I'm telling you a real life experience from myself and my many customers that have owned these things. And I'd never shell out for a new one, heck, that kind of money. I'd rather send my grandkids to college <laughs> than waste it on a car. But if you want luxury in a car that is gonna last a really long time, and hardly ever break down, and not be all that expensive to maintain either. I mean, you don't go to the dealer, just find a regular mechanic like me that works on it to take care of the thing. Stay away from hybrid Lexuses. My customers with hybrid Lexuses, they loved them when they were new, but then when they got 10 years or older and started to break down, man, the parts cost a fortune for them because there's really no aftermarket for that hybrid stuff. You're talking dealer then, and the prices will just astound you. But if you're looking for a nice, reliable, long-lasting luxury car, hey, get yourself a Lexus that's got a V6 engine in it. In 2019, Toyota started to come back with the Toyota Corolla hatchback. So we're gonna analyze this one here to tell you what kind of a car it is. Good, bad, I'll tell you the truth. Now they started out with a bad image for one reason. When they first came out, 3,400 of them were recalled and the entire CVT transmission 
was replaced. Now most of them were actually never even sold. They were just sitting on the lot, so people didn't even drive them. It was when they changed to that launch gear CVT, so they take off. They had a problem with it, but they replaced 3,400 of them free, and like I said, most people never even owned one. And considering that Toyota has sold over 45 million Corollas, the fact that they had to fix 3,400 of a new design isn't that big of a deal, if you ask me. Now this one isn't affected by that at all because it is a standard transmission it's a six-speed standard and none of the 2020 up ones had problems with the CVTs it was only 3400 that's not a reason not to buy one because even if you got one of those 3400 they replaced it with a brand new transmission that didn't have that problem they had some kind of a design flaw with it and that doesn't exist in them so whether you're getting a CVT or standard transmission it doesn't matter they're solid reliable cars like all Toyota Corollas now I find it interesting that they did not call it a Toyota Matrix to bring back the name. You take my 2007 Matrix. Originally, they were called Toyota Corolla Matrixes, and when you look at the shape of it, 12 years later, this Toyota Corolla hatchback really looks like a modernized version of it. <laughs> now, whether you get a standard transmission or a CVT, these things get phenomenal gas mileage. My son's got one. He gets over 42 with CVT. This one's a standard. If you're not driving it hard, <laughs> you're probably going to get a little bit higher than that. They are fantastic on gas mileage, but with the six-speed, it's got a lot more zip. There's no arguing that. Now, the CVT version has that launch gear, so it has an actual first gear. So it does accelerate a lot better than most other CVTs, other than Honda, because Honda also has a launch gear on theirs it's a very similar system even though they're made by different companies but this being a standard is a very zippy fun car to drive as you'll see in a little while a lot of technology but it's toyota technology it's a two liter four cylinder engine and it's got both systems on it it has both the GDI, that's the high pressure fuel pump for the gasoline direct injectors. But when you look here, you can see it also has port injectors on it too. And to top it all off, the variable valve timing system on it is now electronic and computer controlled. So it's even more responsive. So it's got a complex, but knowing Toyota, very dependable engine. And as we go inside, it's a long way from the early Corollas. Very comfortable seats, nice design. They're also heated seats. We start it up. Of course, it starts right up. It's got all the modern interfaces here. You got all the controls right on the steering column. And with all this leather, it really has a nice style to it. When our kids are young, we drove them around a four-door Corolla. It had a black and white interior like this. That was about the only similarity. It was a very Econobox car. This is not an Econobox car by any stretch of the imagination. As you can see, decent amount of room in the back. Got the nice comfortable seats there too. And being a hatchback, of course, it has a hatch. Plenty of room here. Drop the seats, and you got a ton of space to throw stuff in. Although, truthfully, in a car this nice, I wouldn't be throwing a bunch of crap in it. <laughs> I wouldn't be carrying plywood and stuff in it. It's too nice for that. Got great alloy wheels, humongous brakes, my old Matrix. It's got big discs in the back, too, not drums. They've gone a long way. Got something hiding in here, too. Pedestrian detection, so you don't whack into people. If you're looking at your cell phone, it's going to warn you. And it also has the safety avoidance. All kinds of computer stuff with the camera there but here's one caveat do not follow sand and rock trucks closely because if a rock hits that windshield and it's broken replacing that costs a whole bunch of money so do not drive on old dirt roads with rocks flying all over the place or you're gonna have an expensive windshield replacement many modern cars that way so you see rocks coming off a truck either slow down or speed up and go around them don't follow them so let's take it for a spin see how it goes now the first thing you're gonna notice is not only does it handle quite well but for a Corolla it's got a really nice ride to it my old one in 81 was like driving on railroad tracks this is not what happens when you you step on the gas well it's got a nice smooth power band depending on how high you shift it you're gonna have more acceleration but it's got plenty of zip there's no arguing that now it has an intelligent manual transmission watch this when you downshift it's set up so you don't even have to tap the gas it automatically rub matches by itself using the computer you don't get any lag whatsoever and for those of you who've never driven a standard transmission that makes it a lot easier to learn and this thing is so smooth anyways you might think twice about buying an automatic because having six speeds 
you can have a lot of fun you can get great gas mileage by going in synth gear at low rpms or you can get a lot more acceleration by leaving it up this thing is so fuel efficient you're not really going to care about stepping on it every once in a while that reminds me of a friend of mine in the 60s he had a pontiac firebird with a four barrel and he never stepped on the gas more than a third of the way because when he went past that it opened up all four barrels and he'd get about four miles a gallon you don't have to worry about it in this thing and of course it's got all the modern conveniences here all the apps that you want for your phone anything that you really need you can hook your phone up to so now you know a little bit more about them bringing back the toyota corolla hatchback you know what my big question is why did they get rid of it in the first place? I guess they got so carried away with SUVs, they thought, ah, ah, who wants that? Many people want a hatchback. They do everything. You know, you can fit a lot of people in this, and you got a hatch to put stuff in. They're very logical cars. My old Matrix. Hey, I have to say, that's probably one of the best well-designed transportation devices of all time. And when you're making a hatchback out of a Toyota Corolla, where they sold over 45 million, they've obviously done something right. Now, this really has Scotty's approval because check it out what does it say in the door made in japan they do make toyota corollas all over the world in many places take my advice you're thinking about buying one look at that door jam if it says made in japan you're getting the absolutely best made one and people always used to say oh toyota corollas what a boring car i don't think this thing looks boring at all so if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos Remember to ring that bell!